Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Brian Martin, and I'm the director of the Master of Public Health program at Eastern Virginia Medical School. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this COVID-19 update, which is a follow-up to the Public Health Grand Rounds we presented back in February, which was when we were in the earliest phase of the pandemic. It's been a pleasure to work with Dr. Cynthia Romero, director of the M. Foscu Brock Institute for Community and Global Health at EVMS to develop this webinar. And we have some exciting speakers that can really provide some great updates for us. Dr. Romero? Yes, hello everyone. On behalf of Dr. Richard Homan, President, Provost, and Dean of Eastern Virginia Medical School, we welcome you and thank you for joining us today for this COVID-19 update. I am Dr. Cynthia Romero, Director of the M. Foscu Brock Institute for Community and Global Health at EVMS. The Brock Institute collaborates within and beyond EVMS to provide education to learners and leaders across the region to improve the health of our community. We are grateful to partner with Dr. Brian Martin and our Master of Public Health program to host this webinar to provide you updated information to better prepare yourselves, your families, friends, and neighbors for the days to come. To provide these updates, we are joined by a distinguished panel of experts. Dr. Edward Oldfield III is a professor of internal medicine at EVMS and an infectious disease specialist. Dr. Serena Newman is a psychologist, professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences, and the institutional wellness officer at EVMS. Dr. Michael Hooper, is an Associate Professor of Internal Medicine at EVMS and Vice President of Medical Affairs for Centera Norfolk General Hospital. Dr. Douglas Mitchell is a Professor of Pediatrics at EVMS and Medical Director for the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters Medical Group. Dr. Nancy Welch is an Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at EVMS and Director of the Chesapeake Health Department. After our panelists have shared their presentations, there will be a question and answer session facilitated by Dr. Vincent Rhodes, Assistant Vice President at EVMS Communi Marketing and Communications. Let us begin with Dr. Oldfield. Good afternoon. I'm going to start with, uh, can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Go ahead. Okay. So we're going to do an update, uh, what you should know about COVID-19. And we'll start just with the terminology. When the virus was first discovered, it was called novel coronavirus. We soon learned that it was very closely related to the SARS virus that caused the outbreak in 2003, so it was renamed SARS coronavirus 2. The disease it causes is called COVID-19 or coronavirus disease 2019. Now globally, uh, it's truly a pandemic. 214 countries have been affected. Uh, note that 97% of all the cases have been outside of China. And unfortunately, the United States is number one in the number of cases. And any number I gave you would be wrong within minutes as we get new cases reported. For the US, 800,000 cases reported so far, uh, but a recent study from Los Angeles suggested that that number may be anywhere from 20 to 50 times higher than the reported cases. Most cases have been in New York and New Jersey uh, but it's important to note that 80% of all the rural counties in the United States have reported cases. For the state of Virginia, you can see as of April 22nd, we've had over 10,000 cases reported. And the next column, the new cases, you can see that we're on a plateau. We're running somewhere around 600 um, plus cases uh, every single day. Now, on the far right for deaths, you can see we're also on a slightly rising plateau uh, around 25 uh, deaths per day in Virginia. Now, as far as the cities are concerned, much more uh, of a problem in Northern Virginia, in particular Fairfax and Arlington, 
Uh, there was a, a an outbreak in James City County, which ended up with cases near Williamsburg. On the south side, you can see Virginia Beach uh, has 313 cases as of yesterday. Uh, Chesapeake is number two, and Norfolk is number three at 126 cases. And on the peninsula, Newport News has 101. So what is a coronavirus? There are seven different of these RNA viruses that cause human disease. Uh, four of them uh, are endemic globally, and every year they come back with annual outbreaks. They ca cause between 10 and 30 percent of all the common colds in adults. There are two other ones that are much more severe. Uh, SARS, uh, 11 percent of people died from SARS in 2003, and MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, with a 35 percent mortality. All of these coronaviruses uh, originate in bats. Uh, in fact, bats have uh, been found to have over 500 different coronaviruses, and we're only at number seven. Uh, you can see from this slide that the original SARS uh, coronavirus at the top is very closely related to the bat coronavirus, and at the bottom on the left, you can see our novel coronavirus very, very similar to uh, a bat coronavirus. Now, what happens is generally the bats transmit it to an intermediate uh, animal, and then that animal transmits it to humans. So in this case with SARS in 2003, it was a civet cat. These were actually kept live in the restaurants until they were ordered, uh, and that's a very good way to transmit viruses between species. And where they had these uh, animals live was in what we call wet markets. And you can see these cages stacked one on top of the other with different species of animals side by side uh, with the keepers sleeping uh, beside or on top of these cages, a perfect way to get a cross species jump. So how does this virus spread? It's felt that by far the predominance of infections are by droplets. And these generally will go only about uh, three feet to a maximum of six feet. There's been some speculation on the smaller droplet nuclei that can uh, travel further, uh, but it's felt by essentially all the experts that it's predominantly a droplet transmission process. Now, if you look at uh, this, we can compare some of the other viral diseases. On our y-axis vertically, you can see at the top, we've got MERS and Ebola with a very high mortality. In the uh, tan box, this is where uh, COVID-19 would be, probably somewhere between uh, 0.6 and 1.5% mortality. Uh, on the infectiousness, on the x-axis, you can see the common cold. Uh, COVID-19 is probably uh, significantly more transmissible and then, but not nearly as bad as chickenpox and nowhere near uh, measles. Now, if you have a uh, disease like SARS that most of the people had severe illness and you didn't peak uh, your viral excretion until seven to ten days into your symptoms, then you could um, find the cases, you could quarantine people, do contact tracing, and control the disease. In fact, um, SARS was eliminated in just four months. On the other hand, if you have a virus where most of the infections are mild or asymptomatic, it's going to be extremely difficult to control the disease. So what we've been seeing is pre-symptomatic transmission that can occur one to three days before any uh, symptoms begin. In fact, of the uh, sailors on the USS Teddy Roosevelt, 60 percent of them uh, have not shown symptoms. And it's the estimate that maybe 45 to 60 percent of all transmission occurs before symptoms begin. Overall, 25 percent of persons excreting the virus never have any symptoms. So how infectious is COVID-19? Uh, the study of the first 10 U.S. imported cases with very um, close follow-up of 445 close contacts, only two household, household contacts became infected. So that's a 0.45% overall infection rate for close contacts. For household contacts, it was 10%. On the other side of the coin, you have these what we call super spreader events. 
the Biogen meeting in Boston with 175 attendees, no one had symptoms and 77 people got infected attending that meeting. There was a church choir practice in Washington State. No one was symptomatic. They practiced for two and a half hours, 60 members, 45 infected. Uh, Virginia Tech environmental en engineer has calculated that there can be up to a thousand fold individual difference in the amount of virus that's inhaled. So some are not very infectious. Some can result in super spreader events. Now, what we want to do is delay the peak of the epidemic. Uh, the hash line would be our healthcare system capacity. We don't want to exceed that. So with our social isolation and distancing, we want to flatten this curve uh, and stay under the healthcare system capacity. It may make for a longer outbreak, uh, but at least it will stay within the bounds of what our healthcare system can do. Uh, this is just an example from the Spanish flu in 1918. Uh, the president said that there should be uh, social isolation, major events should be canceled. Philadelphia held a large parade, and you can see this tremendous peak in uh, influenza cases in 1918 that overwhelmed the system. St. Louis immediately undertook social isolation. You can see that flattened curve, uh, which was much easier to take care of from a healthcare system perspective. Now, disease severity, 80% of cases are mild, but these people still have large quantities of virus. And because they're not very sick, they continue to carry on the usual activity and spread the infection. About 15% are severe enough to require hospitalization. Three to 5% end up in the intensive care unit. And somewhere, at least according to the WO, around 2% uh, will die from this infection. So what could you expect if you got COVID-19? Very common uh, symptoms are fever, a dry cough, myalgias, muscle aches, and fatigue. And very uh, typical of COVID-19 is an altered or complete loss of smell. Up to two thirds of patients have uh, found this as a symptom. Less common, uh, runny nose and sore throat uh, and GI symptoms. Now, what happens then after that first week, uh, around a, a median of eight days after onset of symptoms, patients begin to have trouble breathing. They start breathing more rapidly and deeper. This is the time to go to the emergency department and sooner rather than later. Uh, cover um, your uh, nose and mouth with a mask and let them know when you come that you're concerned this might be COVID-19. Uh, early on, this is very responsive to oxygen therapy. Uh, people do better when they're in the prone position, and they've actually um, called these people happy hypoxic. They run very low levels of oxygen um, and um, seem to be fine talking on their cell phones. But the problem is you can go from that stage to a very rapid uh, worsening. And what this represents is a shift from the early viral symptoms for that first week to a completely out of control immune system, which we call a cytokine storm. So on the left, on the top, you have a normal immune response triggered by a virus. You recruit the cells to go fight the uh, virus. Uh, there are some inflammatory markers, and then we get damaged lymphocytes. They release even more cytokines. The immune system goes out of control. This inflammatory reaction continues to increase until we basically begin to destroy multiple organs in our body, uh, in particular with COVID-19, the lungs. And it's really almost like a, a tornado a vortex of these uh, cytokines that can be quite harmful. So who is at risk of having a bad outcome? Over 80% of the people who died in mainland China were older than 60. So that is a key risk factor. 75% had an underlying health condition, which we call comorbidities, that put them at greater risk. And two thirds of the fatalities were men. So men seem to be uh, more significantly affected. And if you look at this slide, you can see that from 40 to 49, less than a half a percent of people would die from this disease. 60 to 69, it goes to 3.6%. 70 to 79, 8 percent, and then over 80, it's 15 percent. And then the comorbidities, heart disease, diabetes, chronic lung disease, high blood pressure, 
all increase uh, the chance of dying. And obesity, it turns out, has been a significant risk factor in New York City. So people with over 60 and with comorbidities, these are the people that should be especially careful with COVID-19. Now, it's been said that this is just like the flu, and uh, believe me, it is not just like the flu. Even for younger people age 20 to 29, the mortality rate for COVID-19 is 33 times higher than seasonal flu. So what about testing for COVID-19? There are two different tests we're gonna talk about. Firstly, uh, is diagnosis of acute infection. This is done with a swab, usually in the nose uh, and posteriorly to the pharynx. And then it's placed in a tube of transport media. Then the viral RNA has to be extracted from that swab and then a PCR test is done. And I've highlighted these four steps because if you have a deficiency of swabs, you can't test. If you have a deficiency of transport media, you can't test. The um, chemical that's used to extract the uh, RNA from the swab is in a nationwide short supply. Now, the PCR detects the virus, but it doesn't tell you whether the virus is alive. It just tells you the viral RNA is there. And even if alive, it doesn't tell you whether there's enough virus to be transmissible, but it does tell you you have infection. And if it's positive, uh, it's 95% correct. Unfortunately, it's only in the range of 75% sensitive. In other words, 25% of people that actually have COVID-19 infection, this test may come back negative. So are we testing enough? The answer is no. Average of 146 to 150,000 people are being tested per day, about 3.6 million total. Uh, a Nobel Prize winning economist came out today and he said he felt that we needed 30 million tests per week to completely uh, open the economy. Uh, on average, about 20% of people tested have been positive. In New York City, it's been as high as 55% tested. When you have these very high rates of positivity and testing, it means you're really missing uh, a lot of people. So it suggests that new infections may have plateaued uh, not because we've hit a ceiling but of cases, but it's a ceiling on testing capacity. We need to at least triple the amount of tests that we're doing. And you can see here, April 15th, we were doing 45 tests per 100,000. We need within one month to ramp that up to 150 plus tests per 100,000 people. Now, the second type of test that you're gonna hear about is an antibody test. This measures the protective immune response that you develop after an infection, and these proteins are called antibodies. Antibodies take about 14 days to develop after an infection, so they're not used to diagnose infection. Uh, that's done with the PCR and the swab. Antibody tests are done with a blood sample. The so testing for antibodies could be incredibly important. It could tell us which healthcare workers and first responders were immune and could return to work. We could staff nursing homes with immune workers. We can decide who can return to work safely. We could select donors for immune plasma, and we could determine seroprevalence, whether there's herd immunity, which would prevent another significant outbreak. And that's probably 50 to 75% of the population positive would give us herd immunity. Now, a problem with these antibody tests, there are only four approved, and none have gone through full FDA testing. They're actually uh, approved under an EUA, and basically what that means is the FDA accepted what the, the company said about the accuracy of the test. There are also 90 other companies that have been allowed to sell antibody tests in the United States, even without an EUA, and many of these have been imported from China. Uh, Abbott test does not even have an EUA yet, but it said it's shipping a million of the tests to consumers immediately and plans to up that to 20 million by the end of June. They are working on an EUA. So there are concerns about the low sensitivity. In other words, you have an antibody, but the test comes back negative, and the specificity, uh, whether when it says it's positive, it's a true positive that you're really immune. This is our particular problem with point of care rapid tests, the kind you would get in your doctor's office. There are also concerns about cross reactivity with those other four coronaviruses that cause the common cold. And even if a person's positive, it's unclear whether these antibodies are actually protective and how long that protection will last. 
uh, in the United States right now, it's probably less than 5% have been infected, possibly as high as 10, maybe 15% in New York. But in China, uh, where the whole outbreak started in Wuhan that was locked down, only 3% of the population had antibodies. And so what this means is if you take Celex's FDA authorized test, it has a false positive rate of 5%. In a community where 5% have had the virus with a 5% false positive rate, that would mean that as many of the positives that you get are false as there are true positives. So we have a real problem with the testing characteristics of these antibody tests. Um, and some people said uh, no test is better than a bad test. The British government bought uh, $20 million worth of antibody tests from two Chinese companies. The problem was they didn't work and they're just sitting collecting dust on the shelf right now. Can you be reinfected? Uh, currently there are reports from South Korea of people uh, apparently having negative PCRs and then coming back positive. But if you looked at the SARS cases from 2003, their immunity was durable with very specific and protective neutralizing antibodies that were still positive in 89% two years later. So I'll end uh, just with a, a couple of comments on treatment. Uh, there are no proven effective treatments. Uh, steroids have delayed viral clearance and initially we said um, that they probably shouldn't be used. However, new data suggests they decrease mortality by helping to control that cytokine storm. Uh, protease inhibitors used for HIV have been studied. Uh, the results are inconclusive. There have been numerous studies on chloroquine and in particular hydroxychloroquine. And the last four to five um, studies have not supported the use of hydroxychloroquine. We need to await uh, controlled uh, randomized trials to really get the answers. Remdesivir is experimental and uh, there's some interesting early data. And favipiravir uh, is a very potent antiviral that's already approved in Japan for influenza. And again, we wait, await studies on both of those. So with that, I'll end my uh, presentation. Um, and I assume we're gonna wait for questions till the end. That's correct, Dr. Oldfield. Thank you, Dr. Oldfield. Um, now we will welcome Dr. Serena Newman from EVMS Psychiatry. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for allowing me to uh, present on one an, another important part of what's happening with this um, this COVID situation. I'm just going to share my screen with you right now. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Great. So um, we're going to talk about mental health, which is one of the most important parts of your health in order to take care of yourselves during this um, unprecedented time with uh, the coronavirus pandemic. And I wanted to let you know that a poll that just came out yesterday stated that almost half of the U.S. Um, adults reported that their mental health was negatively impacted due to worry and stress over the virus and the impact that it's having on um, being socially isolated, worrying about protecting themselves and others from the virus. Um, people are worrying about job loss and financial consequences. And this is probably about double um, the distress levels that we would typically see on any given day prior to um, this this uh, pandemic. So I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about this because the negative impact that this is having on our on our society's mental health is likely leading to new mental health concerns um, and issues as well as substance use issues. 
So as with any crisis, you're going to see a rise in anxiety and stress. Dr. Newman, you've been muted. Sorry, I don't know how that happened. Um, let me just start at the beginning. I want you to be aware that feeling more stressed right now is, is pretty normal. We see this with crises um, all the time when um, we had other infectious uh, issues with Ebola, we saw a rise in anxiety and fear. So that this is quite normal. It's particularly a problem though for those who are already struggling emotionally, financially, um, or having issues with um, living life in, 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 in everyday matters. Um, and for a lot of people, this uh, stay in shelter, um, guidance has had them staying at home where it's not always safe for them um, due to issues with physical and um, other types of abuse happening in the home or um, not really having an environment that's enriching for them. Adolescents and older adults may be at higher risk for mental health issues as well, so we have to um, be conscious of that. So we're um, already seeing increases in mental health needs and barriers to access with those needs. Um, we're concerned about uh, resources not being open um, due to the the virus um, and the stay at home, stay in shelter um, guidance. We are um, feeling more isolated feeling guilty if we're having to depend on others to help us if we're at higher risk for being infected. Um, we may be feeling increased levels of distress. Having mental health concerns before the outbreak, such as depression, puts you at higher risk for recurrence of depression and worsening of depression. Um, people who are living in lower income households are having language barriers and finding help um, that meets their needs with those langu language barriers um, being accommodated um, and experiencing stigma because of age or race or ethnicity, disabilities, or perceived likelihood of spreading um, the virus. So um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about some signs that, I don't know why my my slide's not advancing, let me see. There we go. Wanted to help you be aware of some signs and what we can do if we are feeling a little more distressed right now, because really, if you don't have your mental health, it's very difficult to keep yourself healthy otherwise. So um, I wanted to go over the three, the four R's that um, are, are simply the beginning of helping ourselves and each other um, maintain our, our well-being during this, this stressful time. So the four R's, um, if you address them, will help reduce your risk for physical ailment as well as mental health issues. So the first is um, rest. Um, rest means you, you need to make sure that you're being conscious and mindful of how you're feeling. Take some breaks, pause often during the day. Working all day is not going to help anybody. Make sure that you're, you're keeping your body and your immune system well by keeping yourself as calm as possible during the day. Nourish yourself with healthy food choices and hydrate. Um, often is going to also help keep you healthy mentally and physically. Make sure that you're sleeping a uh, regular sleep schedule. Keep yourself anchored in a schedule during the day, sleep being a, a very important part of your uh, immune system health as well as your mental health. Um, you wanna be talking and connecting with people, sharing experiences of what's going on and what's what you're worried about, concerned about. 
um, physical distancing does not mean that you socially di uh, disconnect from people. It's actually a time to make sure that you're connecting in meaningful ways with other people via the internet, um, email, any kind of social media, if possible. I also wanted to just make everybody aware of some very important signs that you may see in someone who may need help. Um, so these are signs that you see in behavior or uh, functioning that would be outside the norm for someone. And the more of these signs that you see in a person and the more frequency in which you see these signs, the more likely they are in need of help. So there's about 24 here and there's actually um, more and uh, we have a website set up so that you can check some of the, some of these other resources out but uh, I'll name a few irritability um, more frustrated uh, showing signs of aggression throwing things slamming doors maybe yelling a little bit more they may be um, hoarding things or there may be some increase in use of alcohol or drugs to cope with feeling more stressed. They may have difficulty concentrating. You may see changes in sleep. Um, you also may see changes in communication. They may be communicating at unusual hours. They may be com complaining more, maybe um, criticizing, gossiping. Um, they could also be using social media at odd times and maybe going off on rants on very negative um, messaging, possibly even saying um, things that are threatening. And these, these communications can be um, very lengthy. They may feel more distractible. They may you or they may have um, changes in energy, so feeling very tired during the day, maybe falling asleep during an inappropriate times. Um, you may also see a lot more emotional uh, changes during the day, lability going from very sad to um, and tearful and crying to feeling on top of the world, um, very excited about things, um, and that would be inconsistent for them. You may see some um, inconsistency in the way that they're communicating, meaning um, they're, they're withdrawing from communication. They want to um, be left alone. They're not enjoying things that they usually enjoy and not participating in things. They're less enthusiastic about life. So these are some really important um, signs, and um, there are more. Some more serious signs that I, I caution that you or someone else may need help is when you're talking more about your fears um, and it's kind of dominating your conversation with people um, or conversations with others, talking a lot more about death, feeling hopeless, worthless, or having no reasons to live. There may um, be an increase in thoughts and talk and collection, maybe hoarding of weapons, ordering weapons, um, viewing weapons online. Also, at, during more serious uh, mental health um, times, you may see people taking greater risks, driving extremely fast, um, doing things that they wouldn't normally do and that put their lives at risk. And remember, the more you notice these signs and the, the more frequent you see them in yourself or others, the more serious it can be. So the third R is to respond. So if you're noticing these signs, in yourself, you want to make sure that you um, talk to someone about it, communicate about it with a trusted friend, um, a, a neighbor. You can call someone um, that you know might know others who could help. You want to talk um, if it if it's happening with someone else. You want to make sure that you're talking with someone about it privately and in a calm way, and start out with general. Um, questions like, how you doing lately? Um, you know, I noticed that um, you've been struggling with um, communicating with me regularly and other things that might be important for um, for them to, to notice. So you want to let them know that you've noticed signs of distress in them. Um, it's hard to deny when you list those out for them. 
and it and and show that you care listen to them understand what's going on show acceptance and acknowledgement of what they're saying and try to reflect as much compassion as you can for them and then you always want to have some resources on hand so this is really important for the community to have in hand as they're helping themselves or others with uh, emotional distress and um, the EVMS Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences team are currently providing mental health care to our community. We are equipped to provide telehealth services and phone services for those who are in need in our community. If you need to find out more information, we have information on our website as well as you can call this number that I have listed here, 446-5888. We also have uh, resources on our uh, EVMS COVID-19 wellness website, important resources to support and bolster well-being of our community and each other. And it includes ways um, that our community can get trained to help with mental health needs as the crisis um, continues. Um, and uh, we need uh, everyone, a village, to help us um, keep our community healthy and strong mentally and physically. So I encourage you to go to our website and look at those resources that we have listed. There are also some um, more general resources that are out there, and they're excellent, very good. There has been a, a large increase in the, utili in the utilization of these resources, two to three times what is normal um, since the COVID crisis. So we always have the National Domestic Violence uh, Hotline. Remember, as I said, shelter in place is not safe for everybody. And they're open 24 seven. Um, please call if you feel like you're in danger in some way. Also neighbors or community members, if you suspect that there's some child abuse or domestic violence happening, please help out by calling 911. We also have the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, please, um, if you have someone who is feeling suicidal or you're feeling suicidal yourself, please call them. They'll help you get to the resources you need. We also have a free mental health helpline help line for everybody. Um, you can call or text to connect with trained counselors, and they'll help guide you and navigate you to the resources needed. And of course, you always have EVMS and the Brock Institute who connect with our community um, mental health providers, the Community Services Board, um, the Chaz Foundation, um, Need a Lighthouse, uh, they're all out there to, to help you. We also have a Virginia Behavioral Health um, Council that can, can um, provide resources, and they have a website. We have SAMHSA. So all those resources are listed on our website here at EVMS. We're your hub for mental health. So if you need help, please call us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Newman. We will now hear from Dr. Michael Hooper from Centera Healthcare. I see you doctors here at Norfolk General. I've been here since 2011 and now the Vice President of Medical Affairs. But I just wanted to speak to you all for a brief minute about what data we've been looking at here at Sentara and what our plans are moving forward to ensure the health of the community during this crisis. So um, in terms of uh, Sentara Healthcare, um, we're looking at a lot of the data that people are looking at around the state. Um, we're constantly looking at the coronavirus data maps that are put out by Virginia Department of Health and this includes VA, uh, Virginia statistics, as well as statistics for Norfolk. Uh, and this is the data that we're looking at currently, uh, about 10,000 cases throughout the state, about 1,500 hospitalizations to date, and about 300 deaths. You can see the breakdown by age groups, by gender, and by ethnicity or race uh, in the Virginia statistics and the Norfolk statistics on the screen. The light blue uh, in these graphs shows the uh, amount of hospitalizations 
and then the dark blue uh, shows the number of cases with percentages uh, for how those groups are represented in terms of the overall statistics. So you can see here in Norfolk, we're following a trend which is similar to Virginia and similar to what we're seeing nationally uh, in that the, um, the, the burden of cases is spread across um, many uh, different age groups and adults, uh, but the burden of hospitalizations uh, goes up pretty significantly as age increases. When you look at mortality rates by age uh, across Virginia, uh, this is the data that we're seeing at a state level, and the local data looks pretty similar to this. Um, as, a, as a blessing uh, throughout this pandemic, uh, children have not been severely affected. Um, we are seeing um, uh, occasional tragic cases in younger adults, um, but the rates uh, still remain fairly low, whereas when you look in the older populations, we continue to see uh, pretty high rates of severe illness. Um, now, these rates are based on total case numbers, confirmed case numbers by testing, and due to the testing challenges that were referenced earlier, these numbers may be uh, considerably lower if we did have a significant look at what our real burden of a disease was throughout the community. When you look at the national graphs or curves for new cases um, or deaths, you see that flattening of the curve that we all have been hoping to see as these social measures have uh, come into play. Um, the projections early on showed a very steep exponential rise in new cases and projected deaths. And so fortunately, we have put measures in place and seen that flattening begin to occur. The Virginia graphs are on the right Again, in red, you see the number of new cases on a, on a daily basis. And then in gray below, you see the number of deaths on a daily basis. Again, you see that starting to flatten and certainly is not following that exponential steep rise that we were very concerned about when this crisis began. Our internal numbers for Sentara, on the left, you see Sentara Healthcare, all 12 of our hospitals, on the right, you see Sentara Norfolk General. The blue line represents our total number of patients in the hospital with COVID-19. The yellow line uh, includes the ICU patients on a daily basis uh, with COVID-19. And the red line includes the COVID-19 patients on a ventilator. And again, we see that same trend, that flattening of the curve um, that's really a uh, uh, a sign that all of the sacrifices made in the community to social distance, um, to, to not congregate, um, have had a real effect in terms of what we're seeing at the hospital and what we're seeing in terms of the burden of disease. So what does the future hold? Well, we were preparing for an exponential rise in cases, um, looking at the possibility of hundreds of patients with COVID-19 in our hospital and thousands of patients with COVID-19 in our community. Um, and now we're preparing for a longer term presence of this disease uh, at a, a lower and hopefully manageable level. Um, we are continuing to be concerned about the future possibility of a rapid rise um, if social di distancing gives way and large congregations pick up again. That's something we'll continue to be prepared for. Um, and something we'll be continuing to monitor. Um, and now we're starting to ask ourselves, um, how do we safely deliver care for all patients in this environment um, when we're in the midst of a pandemic? And so our plans for supporting Norfolk now are really twofold. On the one hand, we have our plans for COVID-19 that include closely monitoring cases, um, societal behaviors, projections, policies, um, so that we can have some line of sight of what we're going to be facing two, three, or four weeks down the road so that we can prepare. Um, we are doing everything we can to ensure proper testing capability to support our patients, our providers, and staff. Um, we have ramped up our internal testing um, dramatically um, compared to several weeks ago, pursuing multiple different testing platforms 
that now allow us to test patients in our hospital and get answers back on the same day um, or early the following day. And that's really changed our ability to know what's going on within our own hospital and with the patients that we're admitting. Um, we are employing that, that tool more and more as our capacity increases. Um, we also see as one of our keys for taking care of COVID patients is, is ensuring that we can protect our staff and protect our physicians and nurses uh, from becoming infected themselves. So we have uh, a lot of efforts underway to ensure that we have the right supplies on hand so that people working in our hospital can be protected. Um, and we have rapidly changing policies um, throughout the course of this, this crisis um, to make sure that we're giving the best protection we can uh, to the people working in our hospitals. And then in terms of overall health, um, there have been multiple other areas in Italy New York, Washington, that have described um, very negative impacts on the outcomes of other diseases in the midst of this crisis because people can't come into the, the physician like they normally would. Um, they're scared to come to the hospital when they're feeling sick. Um, so one of the messages we're trying to get out to the community is that due to all the hard efforts in the community, um, the volumes of these these sick uh, coronavirus patients are very low in our community. We are fully capable and prepared to deal with um, with whatever other emergency or illness you've been having. Uh, and we, we're trying to get the message out that um, if you're sick and need to come to the emergency room, it is very safe to do so. And we want you um, to do that. We're also uh, preparing for long-term changes in how we deliver healthcare. We know that people have an appetite for telehealth uh, to avoid crowded waiting rooms uh, and avoid uh, environments where they're scared that they'll be around people that are sick. Um, so we have ramped up telemedicine capabilities quite a bit in the face of this crisis and intend to continue to do that. Um, we are looking at ways to distance and protect people in our facilities um, to make sure that there's not spread of this disease uh, within our walls. Um, we have everyone masking at our hospital um, due to the rates of asymptomatic carriage of this disease to ensure that we're, we're not spreading this disease unknowingly. Um, and then we, uh, like I said, are monitoring and we will quickly change what we're doing if we see surges in cases um, as social measures potentially relax in the future. So that's something that we're keeping a very close eye on. So that's all that I had for today. I look forward to taking some questions at the end. Um, anything I can do to answer uh, for anyone on the call, what Sentara is doing to answer the health needs of the community. Thank you very much, Dr. Hooper. Please note that you may submit questions through the chat or comment feature of the streamlining platform that you are using. We will address as many of those questions as possible during our final segment. Now let's welcome Dr. Doug Mitchell from CHKD Medical Group. Dr. Mitchell, you're muted. If you could start over. Yes, thank you. Is that better? Yes, sir. You know, we always forget something. Uh, it's my honor to be part of this group and uh, hopefully relay some of the things, as Dr. Hooper said, to keep our pediatric patients safe. Um, what we're doing in the area of patient safety is we're screening all patients and visitors at all of our CHKD facilities upon arrival. We have as many in most other hospitals, we've been limiting inpatient visitors. We're limiting the number of people at all appointments so we can decrease potential spread from asymptomatic. Uh, all of our outpatient practices, our general pediatric practices are separating the well and the sick visits by either the location of the practice or by the time of the day. Many of them are doing well checks in the morning and there's more sick visits in the afternoon. We're also screening all of our staff members for signs of illness. Staff are now all required to wear masks when they're on duty. Uh, we're doing social distancing in the waiting rooms, hopefully very little in the waiting room at all and in lines. And we're definitely following the CDC guidelines regarding exposures. And we have extensive printed and online educational materials about what we're doing and how we can keep our children safe. In the area of staff, as Dr. Hooper said, protecting our staff. There are asymptomatic uh, COVID positive patients, so protecting our staff. 
Um, as all other hospitals, a lot of education around the use of personal protective equipment or PPE. Uh, as you see in the media, there's a lot of shortage, and so we're doing everything we can to conserve and reuse when safe, uh, to keep our staff members safe. Uh, we've done some liberal reassignments for those that would be considered high risk. We have a lot of CHKD staff members working from home where possible. And we have daily updates for our staff regarding our new policies and procedures. As Dr. Hooper said, they're changing on a daily basis. We also have an email address available for questions. And we have an occupational health hotline for our uh, potentially ill staff members. For the patient uh, impact, uh, we've had testing available in our hospital since uh, early April. Uh, we expect the more rapid testing to be available in our hospital next week. Uh, we developed a special isolation unit for our expected very small number of inpatients uh, with uh, COVID, and indeed that's been the case. In general, we have a very low inpatient census of all illnesses. And CHKD has positioned itself to support all of our regional neighbors. For example, in preparation for the deployment of the uh, Navy ship to New York, uh, we've been accepting the pediatric ICU patients from Portsmouth Naval so that they could have their staff deploy with the hospital ship. Uh, our volume has been down in all of our outpatient clinics and practices, and so we've got capability to see patients. Um, and we also want to caution people, as Dr. Hooper said, we want to make sure that people are seeking the care they need because uh, delaying care can present with uh, more severe illness. So the impact has been alluded to as a relatively minor illness in the vast majority of children. Um, the shutdown, the separation, the sending home from school also decreased the spread of other illnesses like influenza. It very rapidly went away after the schools were dismissed. As I said, we've been testing since April 6th. We've had three positive tests in that time at CHKD, and only one of those three was younger than 18 years of age. Um, our concerns in the pediatric population is these delays or kids are missing their immunizations. We want to make sure that we keep immunizations going uh, so that we can prevent the spread of other severe illnesses like chickenpox and measles, as Dr. Oldfield alluded to. Uh, as was said by Dr. Newman, the increased risk of domestic violence in homes, increased risk of depression and anxiety in the children, and again, the delay in care for the kids that really do need to receive the care. So our solutions, uh, we're communicating in every way we can, hopefully venues like this explaining the precautions we've taken to keep our children, our patients, and our staff safe. Uh, we do want to um, emphasize the importance of well-child visits and continuing those immunizations. And we, in all of our offices, have ways to do those in a very safe manner. We want the continuity of care for our children with chronic conditions. And we, as others, have rapidly deployed uh, telehealth capabilities in our primary care pediatric offices, our specialists, our surgeons, our urgent care, and our mental health area. So thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be part of this. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell. And now our last panelist is Dr. Nancy Welch, Director of the Chesapeake Health Department. Okay, thank you very much. It's good to be here this afternoon and we've received a lot of good information. And what I want to do is sort of discuss some of the challenges that we've had in public health, mainly related to perception and reality. And a lot of that, as you've heard from the previous speakers, is related to the uniqueness of the COVID virus itself with regards to contagiousness, symptoms, no vaccine and no medication. And the, the first one that I'm going to discuss is the easiest one. Uh, we indicated that people would be home telecommuting. We're doing that for physical distancing. And so this was the image people had. However, there was a bit of reality that came into play here as people went home. And so we have to understand that we need to close this gap between reality and perception. This was easy, but there are lots of other health concerns and medical as well as public health that we need to close. You hear a lot of people who say, well, I'm not concerned about COVID. And a lot of that comes because it's been uh, discussed earlier, because so many people are robust, healthy individuals and they have no symptoms. 
and so it's not put into perspective. But this was information from the 21st of this month, just a couple of days ago, looking at the average daily cause of death in the U.S. from um, COVID, comparing with some data from 2017 on other diseases. And as you can see, on the 21st, very recently, COVID death certainly exceeded the number for heart disease, cancer, and the kinds of diseases that we normally think of and are concerned about. This, this is another way of looking at it, and a, there have been, again, with the previous speakers, have elucidated on it even more clearly. But what I want you to see here is how the COVID has increased dramatically and look at it relative to the flu, pneumonia, uh, car crashes. Uh, this is certainly a novel uh, virus, and it has escalated at great speed. And here is something that is very hard sometimes to get people to understand, and we just keep looking and exploring for ways that we can help people get a picture of it. And that is that you don't have to have symptoms to be spreading the germ. And of course, that gets back to those who are asymptomatic but contagious. Simply talking and breathing can generate these infectious droplets. And this is not simply uh, hypothetical, these have been looked at, and that's where uh, in the previous uh, speaker's slides you saw looking at the droplets and how far that they travel. And this is where the idea of mask to prevent the droplets from spreading to others, and I'm going to come back to that in just a sec. I protect you, you protect me by wearing a mask. This has been a very difficult concept because we look at masks uh, or the general public looks at masks as a way that protects them from getting the virus. Yes, that's true with N95, but when we are looking at these procedure masks or cloth masks or surgical masks, it's mainly looking at protecting the virus from getting from you out into the environment. Because again, so many people are asymptomatic, but yet they're contagious. And the idea is by reducing the viral load within the community, then you are reducing the opportunity for people to be exposed to it. Because we don't know who is out there and around us who is vulnerable. It's not just based on age, it's based on a lot of comorbidities that don't show itself in our general appearance. For example, these are the vulnerables who are walking around in the community looking like anyone else, but who are vulnerable because of medications they're on, because of different diseases they may have that doesn't show itself. So truly, this is the, I've been in public health now for over 40 years, and this is the disease with the greatest impact being made by how we think of how we can help each other. It's not related to medicine or not related to vaccine, but what is going to make the difference in this is our own selves and our own behavior, because that's what we've got. And that's what we've got to work with at this stage. Others coming down the road, but right now, that's what we've got to work with. A, a number of people are uh, wearing gloves. The bottom line is wash your hands. That's really the most important thing, to wash your hands often or to use hand sanitizers. We, we have them all over the place in my home, at work, everywhere. Um, probably you smell hand sanitizer more than you per smell perfume nowadays. And I really liked what was said earlier on the discussion of mental health. I try not to use the word social distancing. We're human beings. We need social connection. Fortunately, we're in an age with a technology where we can actually do that while still practicing physical distancing. It's the physical distancing that is far more important than social distancing. We don't want social distancing for all the reasons that have previously been discussed. This is a way that sort of puts things in perspective, uh, a simple way that I think people can understand. And that is, again, looking at the flattening of the curve. The, the bottom line is, is that in the absence of vaccine and medication, we're going to hit herd immunity with the same number of patients or same number of people who have been infected with it, whether we do it quickly or whether we do it slowly. The only difference is the impact it will have on our healthcare system which means, therefore, the impact it will have on caring for individuals who are primarily part of that vulnerable population and become much more ill. 
So it's not a matter of overreacting. It is a matter of slowing the time it takes for us to get to that herd immunity, which has previously been mentioned, so that we then are at a more stable position with regards to spread and impact of the virus itself. The, some of these slides have already been mentioned, so I don't need to go over it, but this relates to the number of tests in the U.S. per day. We absolutely need to be doing more tests. As was mentioned, it's recommended that for us to safely reopen, we need to be doing about 152 tests per 100,000 population. Virginia, the information I had on the 15th was about 23. So we are definitely below that curve. And that is a, a very sensitive area that we need to address. <clears throat> this is something I want to <clears throat> get to the testing. Uh, in other countries that are really the model, Germany, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, uh, Singapore, those countries have conducted far more tests than we have in the United States. This is a slide that shows uh, the testing conducted per million folks. Uh, Germany actually tested 10% of its population. You can see that we are way behind on the test per million that are conducted in the United States. And we are not going to be able to contain this uh, virus, no matter how good our behaviors are, if we're not able to practice classic public health, massive testing, isolate the positive, uh, contact tracing, quarantine those who have been exposed. That's what's going to make the difference. We know how to do it in public health, but we absolutely need to have the test. Again, this is sort of, uh, uh, I'm not going to go into this, it's the antibody testing, which has previously been discussed, and, and we will all be glad when it comes down the road, as much as anything else, because it can be used in so many parameters for healthcare workers, for people who we know are presumably protected because of the antibody. Again, testing should be a priority for our vulnerable populations. Uh, you've seen the ones who are vulnerable, but we have the uh, seniors, we have those who have underlying comorbidities, we have crowded conditions. So there are a number of areas where we certainly need to be able to test. Again, the roadmap to reopen, this is a, a frequently discussed arena, especially by those who are feeling healthy, feeling well, and yet there are certainly some economic concerns because they're out of a job right now. and. They're bored, they're at home. So there are many, many different uh, kinds of components that become a part of it. But I can't emphasize enough, as every other speaker has, that slowing the spread of the new infection with physical distancing is an absolute key. And that's what's going to help carry us through, keep our health care at a level that it can meet the demand until we do have some effective therapies and vaccines that become more available. These are the key takeaways. Uh, projecting future cases, we have a lot of models, but it's really difficult to say that any one is necessarily more precise than the other. But every single model has shown that physical distancing is indeed working. It is indeed flattening that curve. It's slowing down. It is enabling our healthcare providers to not be overwhelmed and to be able to respond. So we need to continue to do that so that when people are ill, they know that they can get good, solid care. That's what we absolutely need to do, caring for each other. Physical distancing restrictions, we have to be careful about how they're loosened up. There are certainly a number of different phases they can go by. And again, I've mentioned the classic public health model, which requires an abundance of tests. And that is something we all need to be working towards. I've heard someone say this, rest at home is better than rest in peace. Six feet away is better than six feet under. And I've got to say amen to that many times over. Thank you very much, and I'll look forward to questions. Amen, Dr. Welch, and thank you so much for your presentation. Thanks to all our panel of experts for their presentations today. My name is Dr. Vincent Rhodes. Uh, I work here at EVMS as well, and we're going to begin our question and answer segment. Um, I would let our panelists know we have quite a few questions in the queue, so if you can briefly yet completely answer the questions, we can get through as many as possible. Our first question is directed to Dr. Newman. Donna Sanderlin on YouTube asks, 
What should we be doing at home to help a family member with the signs of mental health issues? Will this information be provided after this chat to share with other groups? And Dr. Newman, if you'll unmute. wasn't cooperating and it's still not cooperating. <laughs> we hear you now, um, thank you. Yeah, so the best thing to do is keep a structure in place and try to keep um, things as calm as possible. So if someone's distressed, making sure that you engage them in soothing activities. Um, and then I would certainly, if this is continuing to be a frequent occurrence for distress, I would um, call uh, professionals to help guide you. That would be the quickest and um, most effective way to handle that situation. There are resources on our website for that. For families, there's lots of resources on there to help keep your home safe and calm and productive and fun. Thanks so much, Dr. Newman. Sure. Uh, Dr. Oldfield, this question is for you. Julia, uh, excuse me, Julie, via email asked, is there, I looked at the wrong line, my apologies. Tammy via email asked, is it possible to get COVID-19 from mosquito bites? Uh, no, I can um, confidently say you can't get it from mosquito bites. Um, there's very little um, coronavirus in the blood and they would have to take a, a blood meal and then the virus would have to be able to produce in the mosquito, which it can't. So we're safe from mosquitoes. This is unlike Zika and West Nile, which are transmitted by mosquito bites. Thank you very much, Dr. Oldfield. Dr. Hooper, uh, Julie asks via email, is there any information regarding the rescheduling of elective surgeries at EVMS and Centera hospitals? We could start with you and then perhaps one of the EVMS yeah, folks. So, time. so we are looking at that uh, very closely. Um, so there, there's multiple buckets of elective surgery. There's some surgeries that are truly elective, um, can be put off for a long time without a health consequence. And then there's you know, some surgeries that putting them off cause uh, significant health concerns. And so that second group of surgeries where we're worried that, that having had canceled them and putting them off is putting people's health at risk. We are looking through those right now, along with the physicians who are responsible for those. Uh, and we are trying to get some of those back through the system. We're still working with the state who has a, a, a mandate not to do uh, truly elective surgeries. And we're being very careful that we respect that, um, but also are looking through uh, all those cases and trying to make sure that we don't hurt people by, by holding off on those. So that work's being done now. You can work with your physician office um, and, and they are um, being engaged actively to, to go through their cases and find the ones that need to be done soon. Dr. Mitchell, did you wanna add for CHKD? Yeah, basically the, the same answers, looking for guidance from our governor, um, prioritizing those that are most urgent, and also just a reminder that part of the reason for delaying those surgeries is making sure that we still had available PPE for the frontline folks that were gonna need to take care of the very sick children. And so all of that goes into the calculations of reopening for surgeries. Dr. Romero, anything you wanted to add on behalf of VVMS? I think we're doing essentially the same. Yes, exactly so. And the only thing I wanted to clarify was PPE is in reference to the personal protective equipment and recognizing that there's a, a balance between uh, preparing for additional uh, surges and cases that may be needed in the future versus taking care of patients now. So those are ongoing and dynamic uh, considerations. Great, thank you. Uh, Terry asked via email, I've seen the EVMS recommended treatment. I believe she's referring to the protocol established by Dr. Merrick and asks, why is this not being shared everywhere? I can say anecdotally, it is online and we've had close to 20,000 downloads and views of that page. But Dr. Oldfield, is there anything you'd like to say regarding that? No, we have, uh, the dean uh, has shared that with all the other deans of medical schools in the United States. Uh, I have shared that with the uh, Centera Critical Care High Performance Team, which is all of the um, the intensivist in the 12 Centera hospitals. So it's it's out there, It's but it's optional. I mean, you, you they're just it's, just, it's suggested guidance. 
Thanks so much. Kathy asked via email, I have a question about if aerosolizing with hydrogen peroxide is a good idea. Since coronaviruses have shown in the past to be killed with just 0.05% hydrogen peroxide, is it advisable to take around 3% of food grade solution, aerosolize it, and then let it settle into your nose and throat since this is where the virus sits and replicates for several days before doing damage? I saw another doctor talking about it as a good solution, just once a day for a minute or two and only at 3% or less concentration. What do you think of this remedy or treatment, and is it something you would suggest? And I throw that open to any of the docs on the panel. Well, I just don't know what uh, potential damage and irritation it could do of your nasal membranes uh, and make things worse. There's certainly no data that I'm aware of to support it. I think Dr. Hooper could address the fact that that's what we're using uh, for the N95 mask. It is effective. The question is, is it effective in your nose? And I, I certainly wouldn't do it. Thank you, Dr. Hooper. I think. Um... Like Dr. Olafield mentioned, we are using hydrogen peroxide on many surfaces and materials to make sure that we effectively kill the virus, um, and we will continue to do that. Um, I, I think it is important to realize that there are a lot of um, um, there are, there are a lot of unfortunate suggestions out there on the internet in terms of using various cleaning solutions. Um, to try to kill the virus on a person. Um, and while it may kill the virus, it may do a lot of damage to your body. And um, a, a, high, uh, a high percent hydrogen peroxide would be one of the things that could hurt you if you were to ingest or inhale a large amount of that. So I, I think there's no good data for using that as a, as a, as a cleaning solution on a person. Okay. Um, so, uh, Lisa asked, um, regardless of what politicians are reporting, testing is not available to the general public in the Hampton Roads region. How can Virginia make decisions on reopening when the number of coronavirus cases are obviously inaccurate? Um, she had a presumptive case of coronavirus. She went to the Centera emergency room and was turned away and told to come back only if she couldn't breathe. She's had difficulty getting testing in various places. Um, so, I'm paraphrasing a little bit because it was a long one and we've got lots of questions, but how would you address those concerns? Sure, I, I can start out by talking from the Sintera perspective. Uh, very early on in this crisis, we had no capability to test internally for coronavirus. And toward the end of March, we were able to start doing some limited testing in our facility um, and have now finally gotten that up to where we're able to do um, a good number of tests on a daily basis to support all the hospitals in the area. Our priority has been the ability to test patients in the hospital because it dramatically changes the way that we're going to, to treat patients. Um, we also occasionally will test healthcare workers um, because it impacts their ability to work and perform care and helps us ensure that we're not going to be spreading the virus um, to patients that are sick. Um, in the outpatient setting, there, there are a huge number of people that would like to be tested, and, and I completely understand that. Um, for the most part, for patients that aren't sick enough to come in the hospital, it doesn't immediately affect the way that we would care for them. Um, so while our supplies and capacity have been low, we have not uh, recommended broad outpatient testing. Um, but as Clearly, as was stated in the public health part of this discussion, that is something that we need to ramp up in partnership with the state and with the health department, and that's something that we want to do. And as the testing kits, uh, reagents um, are supplied to us, that is something that we in intend to do so that we can contact trace, uh, isolate, and allow people to return to more of a normal existence, again, with with good safety mechanisms in place. Thank you very much. So Mindy on Facebook asks, what are your recommendations for public schools concerning PPE for staff and students come September? Dr. Welch, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm, I'm sorry, I was, I had some, uh, 
video, not video, but audio problem. So maybe you can repeat it. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Mindy on Facebook asks, what are some of your recommendations for public schools concerning PPE for staff and students when school resumes in September? Well, again, we want to reserve these PPE for our hospital and our healthcare workers. That's where we especially need to be sure that they have adequate amounts. That's first and foremost in our mind. So, and we're talking about schools. I think that we probably are not going to see the schools reopen right now. So it may be a decision with regards to any kind of intervention that can be put down the road because right now PPE is in demand and rightfully so first place for our healthcare providers. We have got to protect them in order to protect the delivery of care that they provide. Great, thank you. As a pediatrician. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. As a pediatrician, in addition to what Dr. Welch said, I would also further that by, you know, we need to rely upon the same old things of if the child is sick, they really need to stay home. I know a lot of families are under pressure for, you know, I need to get to work. Uh, you know, my child's only slightly ill. You know, they had a fever last night, but they don't have one now. Maybe it's safe to go ahead and send them. So that same, you know, we need to be a little more cautious of, you know, if someone's sick, stay home or, you know, as we do in our healthcare workers, if so, and that's the reason for the screening. If you're sick, you really should not be coming to work. And I think those same, same principles would apply when the schools reopen. Great. Uh, Dr. Oldfield, I think maybe this one would be a good one for you. Stephanie asks, originally the public was told symptoms of COVID-19 were dry cough, difficulty breathing, fever, et cetera. Now we're hearing it can cause a rash in children, sudden stroke in adults age 30 to 40, confusion and dizziness in seniors. So what are the symptoms? When should we worry and seek medical attention? So there are symptoms that are extremely common, 70%, 80%. That would be your dry cough, your malaise, your muscle aches, and fatigue. Then there's a group that are less, maybe, and, and then also loss of uh, taste and smell, in particular smell. And then there's a group that's less, maybe in the 10 to 15% range, like a uh, runny nose, sore throat, and then maybe 5% for GI, a nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And then there's a whole host of different symptoms that may only occur in 1% or 1 in 1,000. I mean, we've had literally hundreds of thousands of cases. So there are going to be myriad different presentations. And I've certainly heard of a whole variety of different uh, presentation so far. I mean, everybody's a unique individual and the virus is going to affect them differently, but there are certain ones that say that's very typical of COVID-19. Thank you very much. Uh, just for our viewers, obviously we have about 13 minutes more and we have lots and lots of questions. We're probably not going to get to them all. Um, we will do our best to get our experts to give us some answers and post them uh, wherever it is that you posted your questions. So we appreciate all of you uh, participating. Um, Kelly on Facebook asks, how do the reports of household pets and zoo animals testing positive for COVID-19 change the threat of the virus? Yeah, so that's uh, very interesting. The initial uh, infected pet was in China, it was a Pomeranian dog. Uh, then we found that uh, cats are infected. Then there were lions and tigers. And then they actually did some um, studies where they actually purposely infected cats and dogs and other animals and had them uh, caged near each other. And they found that basically only cats could transmit it to other cats. Dogs didn't transmit to other dogs. Um, and so it looks like this is a, a cat issue, but there's zero data that you can infect the cat can infect the owner. It's the other way around. It's the owners that are infecting their cats, and the cats generally don't have many symptoms. Great, thank you very much. Um, so let's see, sorry. Um, the C someone asked, the CDC recommends that people wear masks, but we've all seen plenty of people wearing them hanging around their neck or only on their mouth, not covering their nose. Uh, on the other hand, some people are wearing them in their cars with the windows rolled up. How should we properly be using masks? And if we don't do it correctly, is it causing more harm than good? And the same thing could be said for gloves. 
I'll, I'll respond to that because, as I indicated earlier, this is a, a real gap between perception and reality. And people should be wearing the mask, not so much because it directly protects them, but what we have with this coronavirus is how we protect each other. And the mask helps to prevent the uh, extrusion of virus within the environment. And when we have less environment uh, with, uh, when we have less virus within the environment, then that means that everybody has less chance of exposure. I, I, I actually comment to folks when I see them and they're not wearing their mask appropriately. I tell them the benefit of it. But sometimes I'm, I'm almost disillusioned because sometimes the response is more related to if it doesn't help me directly, I'm not interested. And this is a psychological or messaging thing that I've not been able to overcome. But it's what we have, how our own behaviors, how we can protect each other. And so wearing that mask is important. Great. And the, the time that it's most valuable is when you're in close quarters with other people or around shared surfaces um, with other people. I think the other thing that I try to remind people in the hospital constantly about is wearing a mask is not enough. You will inevitably touch it and then you will touch other surfaces. So frequent hand washing in addition to masking is extremely important. Great. Brenda on YouTube asks, I think a question that probably is on the minds of grandparents all across the country. When will I know it's safe to be around my grandchildren? The, either Dr. Oldfield or myself could answer that one, I think, um, me from the pediatric room. You know, I think when we have the spread low enough from the public health perspective, and if the grandchildren have been well, um, I think is an important thing. You know, if we know that this in in children is mild, it could just be a cold, and so without testing, there's no definite way to know for certain. But I would limit it to if everybody's been well and we have decreasing spread. Dr. Oldfield. Yeah, as a as a grandfather myself, that's a that's a difficult and very important question. I think it would have a lot to do with. Uh, what are the parents doing as far as physical distancing and isolation? Uh, have the kids been out of daycare or out of school for over 14 days? Are they truly um, socially distanced, physical isolation? And if they've really kept that up and nobody has symptoms, um, it, it may be safe, especially if there are not that many cases in the particular area where you're going to visit. But it is a risk because they can definitely transmit with no symptoms. And if you're 70, 80 years old and you get it, uh, especially if you have other medical problems, uh, it could be very serious. And just think of the guilt that that would engender upon your children and grandchildren. So it's a very, very pithy issue. Thank the you, the other thing I might add real quick that I've given some advice on as well is um, the, the type of visit matters. So having grandkids in your lap in the home, sharing space and surfaces is, is different than going on a walk at the park um, when you're not touching and holding. Um, and it also matters if the child is one that can wear a mask and wash their hands or if they're at an age where they can't do that sort of thing yet. Great. Thank you. Joe on Facebook asks, do you as a group think the 2020-2021 flu season will include a second round of or a continuation of COVID-19, what are the chances of a vaccine being available by then? Yeah, I would say all the projections for a vaccine, they're numerous uh, that are uh, being tested. A number of them are well into the phase one safety trials, but it's gonna be no less than a year uh, and probably more likely a year and a half because even once you've found, gone through all the testing, you've gotta scale up production. Um, I do think that there will be a second wave, um, and this may become endemic like the other four uh, common uh, cold coronaviruses. We just we just don't know. But most people feel there will probably be a surge again in the fall. Dr. Fauci, uh, Dr. Redfield from the CDC. Thanks so much. 
Pammy on Facebook asks, when do you think we can safely and successfully start to reopen? Well, first we have to have follow the president's plan and have 14 days of declining cases. And I think you saw that we're on a plateau. We're not declining at all. We have to really ramp up that testing. And I'm talking three, four, five times more than we're doing. And it would be preferable to have both the antigen test for active disease and the antibody test and a reliable antibody test that tells us whether we're immune or not. Anyone else? Want to answer that on the panel? Thank you, Dr. I just want to second what he what he said. The key here is really the testing, because if we reopen and we and we don't have adequate testing, we're not going to be able to use the classic public health containment strategy, and that's what's going to again, even with reopening, keep the curve flat, and that's something that we cannot neglect. Thank you. The the other thing I would just like to point out is. I hear a lot of people discuss reopening as this binary sort of decision around going back to normal or staying as is. And I think as we get smarter and see the natural experiments happening all around us, we, we may be able to have certain activities in certain populations that can resume in some way, shape, or form with correct distancing, masking, and precautions, whereas um, there are many activities that that we don't need to consider reopening at all. Thank you, Dr. Hooper. Uh, Vanessa asks on Ustream, is there scientific evidence that the transmission of COVID-19 is decreased with increasing temperatures and humidity? I've seen claims of that in the media, but haven't been able to find any clear scientific evidence to support this. Uh, yes, there was some data that looked at uh, countries that in the Southern Hemisphere that were having their summers and there appeared to be less transmission. Um, in general, the coronaviruses, the other ones, the other four that cause the common cold, come back in the winter when it's cold, and that may be partly because of crowding inside, and then go away when it warms up. So there is some data. Um, I don't think, since this is a brand new virus and there was no immunity, uh, this is gonna behave very differently than a seasonal coronavirus that causes the common cold or the seasonal flu. Great, I think we have time for just two more questions before we wrap up. Um, our apologies to all the other folks that we haven't been able to answer. Again, we're gonna reach out to our experts and see if they can provide us some uh, responses and post them. Uh, this is from Jennifer on Facebook who asks, I keep hearing diabetes is a risk factor for COVID-19. My son has type one diabetes. Does a blanket term of diabetes refer more toward type two or does it not matter and include both type one and type two diabetes? Yes, so it would include both type one and type two. You know, part of type two is gonna be confused with obesity and overweight, which is also a significant risk factor for bad outcomes with uh, COVID-19. Uh, a lot of people are starting to look at this more of a vascular disease with clotting and other uh, issues. Um, and so that it may be more the vascular issues like heart disease, high blood pressure, type 1 diabetes, diabetes type 2, uh, than it is necessarily um, lung issues. There are very few asthmatics that have actually had severe illness. So there's still lots of unanswered questions about this, but I would certainly consider a type 1 diabetic to be at risk. So when we start loosening up uh, our social distancing, um, what if I was over 60 or if I had a comorbidity, I would be much more careful about what I did. Okay, um, and we may be able to squeeze in one more additional question after this one. Uh, Amanda on fa Facebook asks Dr. Oldfield and others, should we be wiping down our groceries when we come home from the market? And do you feel takeout food is safe? Yeah, so I would not wipe, I don't wipe down my groceries. Uh, you know, if it does uh, fall on a surface, uh, it's not gonna live that long. And it's, it's, I don't think there's gonna be enough of it to infect you, so I don't wipe down my uh, groceries, uh, and then takeout food should be fine. I don't and just wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Wash your hands, yes. Okay, um, there have been a couple of questions, and perhaps we can just kind of answer this as an overview. Lots of folks have written in saying, "I work for the city, or I work for the schools, or I'm a healthcare worker." 
and they're thinking about when they get called to come back to work and stop remote working. And the questions seem to center around, does everyone need to get tested for COVID-19 before they come back to work in their central location again? So your thoughts on that as our concluding question for any of the panel. I think it's gonna be depend on the access to testing. I mean, ideally we would test everybody before they come back to work for uh, with the PCR test for active infection, make sure they're not asymptomatically excreting. And we'd also love to know for the whole population who's been infected and who hasn't and whether the antibodies you develop are protective and how long do they protect you? So it's, it's all, I think this has come up over and over again. It's all about the testing. We need a national testing strategy. We don't need 50 states all competing for the same limited resources. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel want to respond? No, okay. I'd just say amen to what he said. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, well, we're wrapping up our COVID-19 update. Was there any information that any of our panelists felt like they needed to share that they didn't get an opportunity to share? Okay. Thank you to all of our expert panelists. I know I learned a lot and really got some great information. Again, we'll do our best to try to get answers and uh, post those back wherever the questions were posted. I do want to offer a special thank you to all of our experts and a special thank you to the Brock Institute, as well as the Master Public Health Program here at EVMS and Dr. Sin Romero and Dr. Uh, Brian Martin for all of their work in putting this together. This webinar has been recorded. To access this recording later, you can go to www.evms.edu slash COVID-19. We'll post a link there. Uh, we'll also post streaming links on Facebook and YouTube. Please feel free to share those links with any folks that you think would find today's information helpful. Uh, also feel free to comment and let us know if you'd like to see us do another one of these in the future. I think our experts and appreciate the opportunity to share the information and we'd like to know how helpful you think this is. Um, other than that, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you learned a lot. We hope this will help you uh, as you face the COVID-19 pandemic. And on behalf of EVMS, be healthy and be well. Thank you so much and have a great day.